Confusing is a word often used by viewers to initially describe this story. Full of unforeseen twists and turns and a dreadful ending, it is truly one of the best horror movies of its time. Now, before we begin, I'd like to address this confusion by explaining the plot of the movie as the story gets messed up pretty quickly. A Tale of Two Sisters, directed by Kim Ji-won, is an award-winning psychological horror film released in 2003. It follows the tragic story of two sisters who were recently reunited after having spent some time in a mental institution. The story is told entirely from Sumi's perspective, who looks after her shy and quiet younger sister, Suyeon. Upon returning to their home with their father, the girls must face their wicked stepmother, Eunju. A few days after their return, Sumi and Eunju both have visions of apparitions within the house. Eventually, it is revealed that Suyeon has been dead since the beginning of the movie. It is here where we also find out that Sumi suffers from a dissociative personality disorder and has acted as both Suyeon and her stepmother for the majority of the film. The story ends with a flashback to the day of Suyeon's death as she frantically tries to free her terminally ill mother who hung herself in her closet the night before, only causing it to crash down and crush her. When her stepmother discovered her, she hesitates to help, and after having an argument with Sumi, who is unaware of Suyeon's accident at the time, ultimately decides to let her die under the weight of the closet. This results in Sumi's institutionalization and ultimately leads her to the condition she is in at the beginning of the movie. Now let's pause for a second. I know this is a lot to process at once, but trust me, it'll make more sense as we break down the film step by step. So, today we will be looking at how the elements of cinematography, editing, music, and sound all work together to make this film worth watching over and over again. One of the more subtle aspects of this film was its unique camera work and thought-out editing. Whether it be through different types of lighting, camera angles, shot duration, and more, each scene is carefully planned and executed, perfectly placed to correlate with specific scenes in the storyline. To begin, I would like to start off by talking about a major aspect that is often utilized in this film, lighting, or lack thereof. Although not very easy to initially acknowledge, the lighting in a film plays a major role in manipulating the emotions of individual characters, as well as the overall atmosphere of the scene. This film effectively uses lighting to convey the slight nuances and emotion that the actors are not able to portray in themselves. In this first example, Sumi is having another mental episode where she believes she had an argument with her stepmother. When her confused father tries to help out the situation, we are able to gather the overall darkness of their surroundings. No way, you don't know. As the scene progresses, we can see that one side of Sumi's face gets darker and darker. This is her face by the end of the scene. What? This is to convey Sumi's feelings of betrayal and her feelings of loneliness. Her father doesn't understand how to help her mental well-being. By the end of the scene, we are barely able to make out the right side of her face. In addition, the various camera shots and angles being used also have a great impact on our understanding of the film. As I have mentioned before, the story is told exactly from Sumi's lens and viewers can put this together right from the beginning due to the repetitive use of the numerous over-the-shoulder shots or point-of-view shots. The use of such angles and shot types creates this intentional confusion within the audience, as we are viewing the story directly from the eyes of Sumi, whom we know is not mentally stable at all. The vision she has and the so-called ghosts haunting the house could really all just be a part of her imagination and subsequently ours, making the audience wonder whether anything in the house truly happened or not. Another example of clever camera work is the use of slow zoom in the scarier parts of the movie. These slow zooms create suspense and leave lots of tension in the room. It can also mark as foreshadowing to an upcoming jump scare or influential moment in the film. Moving on to more of the editing aspect. There are many key moments in which the shot duration, combined with the smaller dimensions of the camera and the general claustrophobic atmosphere of the movie, created the ultimate scenes full of dread and suspense.
In the following example, Simi wakes from a nightmare, only to find herself stuck in another. She catches a glimpse of a peculiar creature on the floor. The length of this clip really adds to the tension and instills panic within the audience out of fear of what happens next. Finally, another example of excellent editing as well as shot duration happens towards the end of the film. This is when the big reveal occurs. The stepmother is seen, defeated, sitting on the couch in the living room. All of a sudden, a woman enters. It turns out to be the real stepmother, not the one Sumi had created in her mind. Once the camera dolly tracks a few times around the room, Sumi is seen to be sitting on the exact same couch with the exact same expression, ultimately showing that the sinister version of the stepmother never existed at all. Once again, it was all in Simi's mind. However, this dramatic and suspenseful reveal could not have been made possible without the seamless editing utilized to make it appear as if Sumi had been sitting on the couch the entire time. For this next part, we will be digging deeper into my favorite component and what makes this film stand out so much from the rest, music and sound. Through its memorable film score, original tracks, amazing foleys, and perfectly placed silence, the storyline was deeply impacted by its use. Starting off with music, while being a very easy thing to miss, can establish settings, convey emotion, and even set the tone of the scene, all very common cases. However, the music in this film also tells a separate story of its own. Let's take a further look. The music in this film is composed entirely by music composer and guitarist Lee Byung-woo, his most notable work being creating the film score for this movie. The use of many original songs, such as Lullaby and Epilogue, all very sentimental and melancholic songs, really adds depth to the story. It is also important to note that each song title goes hand in hand with the scene it is chosen for. No Path Back is played at the end of the film when Sumi storms out of her house unknowingly leaving her dying sister behind, signifying her loss and how things will never be able to return to how they were before. While Wistful Memory plays when Sumi fully recognizes her disorder. When she retraces her steps, she remembers her interactions with her sister and stepmother had in reality been with herself the whole time. So although I won't be going too deep into the titles of each song, this connection between title and scene just shows how much thought was put into this movie. Now, let's stop and listen for a moment. Do any of these sound familiar? So, some of these may sound familiar because a lot of the original songs used within the film were subtly reused or even have different versions of themselves, all having the same melancholic motifs and keys as the background songs I played throughout this analysis. Moving on to examples. Crying Moon is a part of the original soundtrack and is unique because it has three different versions. For the sake of time, I will be going over the two most impactful ones. So the first version features a very lighthearted guitar and conveys feelings of nostalgia. In the film itself, the music composer layers it with an emotional string ensemble to really emphasize this feeling of innocence, as in the scene the girls don't know what awaits them in the house.
The second version of this track is purely an ensemble of strings. The solo violinist plays a very high pitch accompanied by lower keys to convey feelings of heavy sadness, which proves to be very useful in the more dramatic scenes as it not only adds tension but really just makes the audience feel a wave of sadness once we learn of the context of the family's dark past. The clever use of this versatile soundtrack really manipulates the feelings of the viewers and grabs our attention effectively. So here's the big question I asked myself after watching this movie. Is it really possible for different music to affect your mood? Well, in case you didn't know, it does. Additionally, the soundtrack of this film is majorly composed in both F minor and F sharp minor keys, which are known to characterize depression, lament, over death and loss, melancholy, and overall sadness. A perfect fit for this movie. Based on this, we can conclude that the soundtrack does its best to make us feel raw emotions of sympathy and fear toward the characters, something only a successful movie can achieve. Moving on to the final element, sound, specifically talking about Foley. The Foley artists that contributed to this film were amazing. They emphasized sounds such as flipping through photos, chirping birds, the rustling wind, bells in the distance, and so much more to create the atmosphere of the setting. Done effectively, these sounds can really transport viewers into the film, and when closing your eyes enables us to picture its exact source. Here is one of many scenes that does this very well. Finally, as I mentioned before, many scenes are almost deafeningly silent. This is not intentional at all. This silence was typically put in a scene that is filled with tension, foreshadowing a jump scare or emphasizing the actor's actions or expressions. Paired with this, sudden loud and sharp noises would interrupt the silence, ultimately making up for some of the scariest jump scares I have ever seen. These moments impacted the course of the entire film, keeping the audience engaged and on their toes, ready for the next event to occur. To conclude, A Tale of Two Sisters, a true cinematic masterpiece and classic within the psychological horror genre, uses a combination of cinematography, editing, music, and sound to transport viewers into the moment and forces us to relive the dark traumas and past of the Bay family. Although I would have liked to cover many more of the elements cleverly employed within the movie, such as the amazing set design and crazy acting, I will be ending this video here with the final thought to go watch this movie as you will not regret it one bit.